motion. Hi, everybody. Um, we ask that you mute if you already haven't. Um, and um, I am here to introduce, um, I'm the program chair for Presque Isle Audubon. And Joy, Joe Geikis, um, who's joining us tonight, um, is from State College, and I'm really glad he didn't have to travel. Um, he's also a health science teacher at Penn State and an avid birder. He's a member of the Penn State Avian Education Committee and the State College Bird Club, for which he is the program chair, by the way. He is especially interested in local patch birding, bird window collisions, nocturnal flight calls, and migration of small land birds. Um, and at some point, Joe, I'm going to ask you to come back to talk about your nocturnal night calls, because that's really fascinating, to, at least to me. I don't know about anybody else. Um, but here we go. Here's Joe Geikus. And I'm sorry, Joe, I forgot. To, <laughs> I had written this down, too. Can you put any questions you have in the chat? And then Mary and I will give them to Joe at the end of this um, presentation. Thank you. Super. Great, thanks Mary, thanks Sue. Um, and thank you everybody uh, for being here. Um, it's not snowing down here, but as I, I'm very happy that I'm not traveling through it to, to get up there. So the wonders of technology, uh, if, you can't, uh, if you can't hear good or uh, anything else, just uh, uh, if you use the hand raising function or mention the chat, we'll, we'll, try, to, we'll try to get it straightened up. Um, but my presentation, uh, is called Unexpected Movements, Backyard Birds Traveling More Than We Thought. And I'll have a special focus on uh, white-breasted nuthatches. So everybody who loves birds knows about migration. Um, we love the neotropical migrants, especially you know, our broad-winged hawks that go all the way uh, to the tropics for the winter. Um, and come back for the summer. And they pretty much have to if they're gonna specialize on eating mostly like frogs and snakes and lizards and those kinds of things. It's not gonna go very well up here in Pennsylvania in the winter. So they, they have to migrate to live that lifestyle. And, you know, our warblers like uh, the black pole warbler, you know, they, they specialize on eating insects and they really have no choice about migration, they absolutely have to get to the tropics uh, to spend um, a winter eating insects. Uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't do it all to, to try to stay north. Um, meanwhile, we have uh, other birds uh, that only migrate sometimes. Uh, this is called facultative eruption in the technical speak. Um, and the the eruptions that they have when they occasionally do their migration uh, is always a, a pleasant surprise for us. Um, we're, we're enjoying uh, evening grosbeak eruption in Pennsylvania. And just uh, this very morning, uh, for the very first time, I had an evening grosbeak appear uh, in my own yard. Um, I was just walking out the door to go to work and I heard one uh, from, from my neighbors uh, side of the street and I looked up and it flew down right at me and landed in the tree right on top of me and I ran inside and grabbed the camera uh, got a picture even I had my sister over and, sh and she got to see it I was so tickled um, and a great example of an eruptive migrant uh, you know a species that um, if they're on their breeding territory and the the trees that they're nesting in um, are just loaded with um, seeds that will carry them through the winter, they'll be happy to stay. Um, while in other years when uh, the food supply in their breeding areas uh, are not great, uh, then they will naturally move and find, find where the food is. So this um, migration by choice uh, is another uh, big part of the, of the story. Another species that you know, we, were, we were very, um, blessed with in, in 2020 uh, was, was the red poles. And, you know, usually when we think about facultative um, migration and, and eruptive birds, we're, we're mostly thinking of uh, finches, but uh, that's, that's not all, all that there are. Um, in this presentation, I have a lot of uh, graphs and figures, and I want to start off by 
talking about the difference between sort of these these mandatory migrations and these optional migrations uh, with some with some graphs. And so uh, the the first pair of graphs that I have are for a robin on top and for a purple finch on the bottom. And these are um, counts uh, done at Cape May uh, Bird Observatory where they have the, the morning flight counts uh, each morning and fall migration at the um, Delaware Bay shore. And they have uh, a huge number of robins migrating. And the number of robins per year is not exactly consistent every year, but it's pretty consistent. And if we look at the total in red of 2016, 2018, and 2020, those falls, um, compared to uh, the, the odd numbered falls, 2017, 2019, and 2021, you get about the same number of robins um, in both years. And that's why the, the red and green are the same uh, height. If anybody's colorblind, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should have uh, fixed that. Um, then um, on the graph on the bottom, we have the purple finch data. Purple finches are a species that some migrate every year uh, down to Cape May, but certainly there are huge differences and it tends to be in an every other year cycle. So if we look at the total of 2016, 2018, and 2020, we have a lot of purple finches counted at Cape May, uh, many thousands. And uh, if we only look at the odd numbered years, 2017, 2019, and 2021, we have uh, really a, a quite small number uh, by comparison. So purple finch is yet another one of these species that is eruptive. And, and the difference between uh, the red line and the green line uh, in the bottom graph is, is showing how facultative they are because that's a huge number of birds that didn't have to move that far uh, some years while uh, they did have to move far the other years. So uh, a couple more examples uh, also from Cape May. Um, we see that the, the two lines at the top are pretty similar. You know, they're not exactly the same, but they're both uh, pretty high for, for rose-breasted grosbeaks. So no matter if you look at the even number of years or the odd numbered years, you still see a pretty big peak um, in September or early October uh, of rose-breasted grosbeaks passing by at Cape May. However, if you look at the bottom panel, we have red-breasted nuthatch, again, another famous facultative migrant, but this time it's one that's you know, not a finch, but it's kind of uh, a member of that group that that uh, erupts every other year. If we look at 2016, 2018, and 2020, huge numbers of red-breasted nuthatches uh, passing by Cape May. But if you look at 2017, 2019, and 2021, there's barely any. So uh, a really dramatic difference in the number of red-breasted nuthatches. And you probably notice that at your feeder, that some winters you get them and some winters you don't. And that's because some winters they can totally stay up in their um, you know, pine forest uh, nesting grounds. And other times they have to uh, get out of those forests and come down to the feeders or come down to the Atlantic coast or whatever they need to do. And uh, the, the thing that I've started to learn the past few years is about uh, the movement of uh, a few species that I thought were in the group that are completely non-migratory. I thought that um, white-breasted nuthatches, red-bellied woodpeckers, tufted titmice, northern cardinals, and Carolina wrens, I thought all these species were resident birds that never did long flights, that never um, had, you know, big migratory movements at all. And um, since I started to learn about this, I, I've, I've found uh, some information about migrations uh, to some extent in these species, most especially white-breasted nuthatches, which I'm going to focus on uh, the most uh, in the first half of my presentation. So the research question that I, I worked on a lot for, for two years is the question, are white-breasted nuthatches um, quietly doing the same thing that red-breasted nuthatches are, which is having huge numbers migrating out of breeding areas in the northern part of the range, um, moving long distances, spending the winter somewhere else, and migrating back in the spring, but hardly anybody knew it. This was, this was the idea. Um, people at uh, Cape May migration counters 
they already seem to know that. And, and other birders, especially along coastlines in different places, they already knew this was going on. But what was written in the um, field guides and in the Birds of the World sort of encyclopedia account of this species uh, said very little about migration and eruptions in white-breasted nuthatch. And they basically made it sound like it was something that maybe happened occasionally in some places, but it wasn't a big thing. Uh, the main thing that was known about eruptions of white-breasted nuthatches uh, actually came from uh, an observation in Pennsylvania. Um, so there is this article published um, based on hawk counters in uh, at Bake Oven Knob uh, Hawk Watch uh, in Eastern PA. And in their 1968 Fall Hawk Watch, they started to notice nut hatches flying by, both white-breasted and red-breasted nut hatches almost every day. And on one particular day, they were shocked to see 80 white-breasted nut hatches zooming over the hawk watch, which is just not what you expect to see from a resident bird that supposedly just nests and breeds in the same little patch of forest uh, and is not a migratory species. You would really be shocked to see them flying over the mountain uh, in those kind of numbers in one day. And when they did uh, see that, they looked around to find out were other people seeing white-breasted nut hatches on a big migration? And so they, they reached out um, to other people and um, they, they asked around, uh, do the Hawk Mountain counters notice this happening? And they hadn't, but they don't really pay much attention to the little birds. They're mostly focusing on the hawks. And they talked to Powder Mill. Did you capture a lot of white-breasted nut hatches um, uh, in, your, in your banding station during that fall? And they said, you know, not, not, not a particularly large number. Um, and, uh, you know, what about down in New Jersey at some of the banding stations on the coast? Um, nothing, nothing particularly dramatic. Uh, it was a big year for red-breasted nuthatches at their station on the coast, but not for white-breasted nuthatch. So the, the Birds of the World account cites this paper, and they just kind of make the point that it seems like the, um, uh, the, the eruption is localized. Uh, it seems it's not widespread. Um, and it seems like uh, it's only really occasional because we have this one paper about it happening in 1968 and very little published in the you know 40 years since. Um, so it seemed like not a regularly eruptive species like red-breasted nuthatch, which erupts almost every other year. So that, that was the thinking. Um, and I'll just throw out a little spoiler that we figured out later on in our research, is that it's really a shame that the Bake Oven Knob guys did not get in touch with Long Point Bird Observatory just north of you uh, on the other side of uh, Lake Erie. Um, at the tip of the peninsula, they have uh, the longest running bird observatory in North America, and uh, they had what I think is the world's highest count of white-breasted nuthatches ever in one location in one day, where they reported 500 white-breasted nuthatches at the breakwater site on the edge of the peninsula, way down uh, in the middle of Lake Erie. This is a location where um, not many white-breasted nuthatches breed, and uh, they had to have arrived as migrants. So that was not just any day. That was three days prior to them counting 80 at Bake Oven Knob. So that incredible eruption was not just some localized thing happening in a couple mountains of eastern Pennsylvania. Those were probably you know, part of a large regional eruption that maybe certain banding stations weren't set up to capture, but um, uh, others others uh, saw it. So th that was that was a bit of a clue. Um, to test the idea in the in the you know migration counters lore that these were actually migratory birds like. Uh, like purple finches and like red-breasted nuthatches that, that were facultative migrants. Um, 
I wanted to know, is it rare or is it common for white-breasted nuthatches to have eruptions? And sort of the, the current belief was that it was rare, but maybe some people think it's more common. Let's, let's look at the data. Um, are these eruptions widespread across you know, a huge uh, part of the continent or is it uh, really localized and it's just like some little, some little areas uh, have eruptions and others don't? Um, if it happens at certain times, why did it happen at those times? And why would one winter they don't fly and another winter they do fly? What's, what's the cause of, of, of their departure? Um, if birds do move, how far do they go? Um, is it only juveniles that move or is it uh, adults? You know, is it a difference between immature versus older birds um, in who's moving? And uh, do they return uh, after an eruption um, uh, heading back in the spring? So that's, that's some of the questions that uh, I was motivated to answer. And I used a lot of different um, data sources uh, to figure it out. So the long point data was a huge, huge benefit. Um, I was so glad that um, uh, Ricky Dunn, uh, an ornithologist from Canada, uh, she strongly suggested that we uh, get access to the long point data. And this was just the most incredible resource to show the migratory behavior in white-breasted nuthatches. So uh, if we look at, at the uh, tip of the peninsula, we see very few white-breasted nuthatches are there in the summer. Um, in August, uh, there's very little going on as far as white-breasted nuthatches uh, at, at this site. And then this is aggregated across many years, by the way. And then starting in September, we start to have an increasing number of white-breasted nuthatches peaking in October and then declining in later October. And the shape of this curve is classic what you expect for a migratory species that, you know, it's not there in the summer, it's there in big numbers in the fall. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what a migration trap like Long Point uh, expects to see for migratory birds like neotropical migrants or, or eruptive species that are coming down out of Canada. So um, that was very compelling uh, in and of itself, but we should also compare different years. And so this chart, um, the blue line uh, shows how abundant white-breasted nuthatches were, and the red line uh, shows how abundant red-breasted nuthatches were. And the main thing that I want you to notice is that in general, if it was a high year for red-breasted nuthatches, it was also a high year for white-breasted nuthatches. And if it was a low year for red-breasted, it's a low year for white-breasted. And this suggests that there's a common cause, that whatever is causing red-breasted nuthatches um, to move, it's also causing white-breasted nuthatches to move. So that's a pretty uh, consistent, you know, it's not exactly lockstep, um, but it's a, it's a very significant um, association over the long term. And, you know, it's so cool to have uh, a migration data set uh, going back uh, into the 1960s. Uh, the little gap, uh, it was, the observatory was closed uh, for a couple years because they had a fire at their station. Um, but this is the longest running um, migratory monitoring data set in North America. So this is black line here is the same exact um, uh, data as the blue line from last um, from the last figure. I just flattened it. Um, it had been sort of angling up. White-breasted nuthatches are getting more common uh, in Canada, uh, like many species that are expanding their range north, um, like uh, tufted titmouse and northern cardinal, which um, places like Philadelphia used to be the, the northern limit uh, of their ranges. They are expanding north and getting more and more common um, as uh, so many species are, are expanding their ranges uh, northward. So this, um, this flattened out line needed to be flat for statistical reasons uh, to compare it to some other data. And let's start comparing the abundance at Long Point to the abundance at some other locations like Hawk Mountain here in Pennsylvania. Um, starting you know, since 1990, Hawk Mountain did actually start to count uh, small birds. And uh, you can see that you know, it's not every year, but generally the years that they have a spike in white-breasted nuthatch numbers at Hawk Mountain tend to be uh, usually years that there's also a spike uh, at Long Point. So it's not a strong correlation, but it is, um, it is related. 
Um, the next line that was added here, this gray one, is Cape May. And you can see that Cape May also tends to spike uh, in the same years uh, as um, Long Point and Hawk Mountain to some degree. And uh, we then got data from uh, window collisions in Toronto. So uh, Fatal Light Awareness Program in um, uh, Toronto has done the, the, the biggest and best uh, window collision monitoring uh, project. Uh, and they have uh, tracked the number of white-breasted nuthatches as well as all other species that are hitting windows uh, in the city of Toronto year after year. And we find that in the years that there are a lot of white-breasted nuthatches counted at Long Point, there is a very nice agreement with the number of white-breasted nuthatches that are hitting the windows in the city. So um, that shows that, number one, it seems like it's mostly migrants that are hitting windows. Um, and you know the, the best agreement with the data is with the closest site uh, at Long Point. The last one uh, that I've added, this blue line, also uh, relates very nicely with the Long Point uh, totals. And this is the abundance of uh, white-breasted nuthatches at feeders across the entire Northeast of North America um, in Project Feeder Watch. So this is across the whole winter across the whole entire Northeastern region, we have a very strong, significant relationship between the abundance of migratory birds passing Long Point and the abundance at people's feeders. The thing to keep in mind though, is because white-breasted nuthatch is such a common feeder bird, most people won't notice the difference between a high white-breasted nuthatch year and a low white-breasted nuthatch year, because you know if you, if you go a whole year without seeing a single red-breasted nuthatch, and then one red-breasted nuthatch shows up, you're like, wow, that's amazing. Red-breasted nuthatches are showing up. But if you had three white-breasted nuthatches at your feeder and now you have four, or if you had one coming almost every day and now one comes every day or two come every day, that's just as big of a difference in terms of total number of birds, but you don't notice it because there were already some that were there. And the fact that white-breasted nuthatches are migrating into areas that already have other white-breasted nuthatches we don't notice it because they just blend into the crowd of existing white-breasted nuthatches. While with red-breasted nuthatch, we totally do notice it because most of them are arriving at feeders that didn't have them all summer long or that they don't come every winter. So this is the, the figure with all that data plus um, another one, um, Prince Edward Point, another Canadian uh, migratory uh, bird observation observatory. And uh, you know, we just show that this uh, had a, a, a strong, significant relationship across all these, um, all these sites. Now, the question is why? Why is it, you know, even numbered years in the fall, we get a lot of them and odd numbered years in the fall, uh, we don't. What's the difference? Um, and to answer this question, the main hypothesis that came to mind was maybe it's the, the native food production wild in the forest, um, maybe good in some years and poor in other years. So these, these illustrations, um, they show a, a beech tree loaded with nuts, a, fam a, a favorite of the nuthatch um, on the left on one side um, in recent years, that's uh, that's what's been happening in the in the odd numbered years, and when there's tons of food in the forest, the idea is that the white-breasted nuthatches in the fall, instead of migrating away, they will just get real busy stashing nuts, and they will they will get the nuts off the trees and hide them in the cracks of their favorite uh, hiding places, and they'll eat that all winter long. And in other winters, when there's very little nuts on the tree, um, they're not going to be busy hiding food they're going to put their energy into going hunting for food somewhere farther south. So they will uh, head out. So that's the, that's the basic idea that um, we wanted to set out to explore. You guys have heard of the winter finch forecast. Um, so I emailed the, the previous um, guy who made that up. Um, and uh, Ron Pitaway, uh, he recommended that uh, I contact uh, some, some researchers in the Ontario Ministry of Forestry 
um, because they were the ones who did a study on the amount of uh, food in the forest. Uh, that, that group was um, mostly funded uh, to keep track of food in the forest because it relates to uh, problem bears. Um, bears tend to be less of a problem in people's backyards when, when food is good in the forest and when food gets thin in the forest, they tend to go digging through trash cans more. So um, they had money to, to track uh, wild food sources. And so that became a data set that I, um, that I would uh, work with quite a bit. Uh, Ron is also the one who put me in touch with Ricky Dunn, uh, who is such a, a huge help in this research project and really, really became our leader as time went on. Um, so here's the figure. You can't see them all, but I just want you to get the drift that there were like 20 different plants that they kept track of how much seeds they've been producing since 1998. Um, in Ontario. And the main thing that I want you to notice is that almost all these species tend to peak with high production in one year and then go down the next year and then up the next year and down the next year. And if we average them all together with our Ontario mast index, then we get an estimation of the total food availability of plant mast in uh, the forests of Ontario. And there's a theory for why plants would all try to produce in synchrony. And that theory is that if they produced exactly the same amount of food every year, then the population of mice and insects and everything that likes to eat those seeds, including birds, would grow to be just the right size to eat every single seed and their seed would basically be totally predated. So by producing a low amount one year, it will starve the seed predators and a higher amount the next year will um, produce so many seeds that the uh, seed predators can't consume them all and that they will uh, successfully uh, germinate. Um, of course, there will also be factors related to the quality of the growing season, uh, whether they are able to produce well. Um, note that one exception of one of these lines that doesn't correlate with the others is oaks. Um, oaks have a, a very different um, mass production cycle than all the other species. Um, so uh, they're, they're sort of a, an exception to all of this. As you might expect, the number of nuthatches that suddenly show up on the shore of Lake Erie at Long Point Bird Observatory or in Toronto um, hitting the windows or in um, uh, Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory and even to some extent uh, down at Hawk Mountain and Cape May uh, is inversely correlated with the um, mass production. That is, if mass production is high, the birds are staying back. And if mass production is low, uh, they're hungry, they're leaving, they're migrating, they're showing up all across the Northeast. So we see higher numbers reported on eBird across uh, the Northeast. We see higher numbers at Project Feeder Watch across the Northeast and um, higher numbers in, in, in the migratory count sites. So this basically supported the first idea that we had which was that white-breasted nuthatches, like red-breasted nuthatches, and like purple finches and, and the other um, uh, eruptive finches are mainly being driven by food availability. And that this natural uh, synchrony of seed production across um, you know, huge forest uh, systems uh, is, is making giant patches of habitat basically uninhabitable in the winter and forcing the birds to migrate out. Uh, and that's why we're getting uh, large migratory numbers uh, those falls. I just want to emphasize the point that even though we might not have ever noticed white-breasted nuthatches are migratory, our regular daily birding is providing key information that it's happening. So this graph shows the percent difference in the percentage of eBird checklists that report white-breasted nuthatches and all across uh, the northern United States and, and southern Canada, um, we see 
that in the eruption years, uh, if we define an eruption year as a year when there's a, a lot of um, a lot of uh, white breasted nuthatches showing up at Long Point, in those years, uh, we see that starting in October, uh, we have, or sorry, starting in September, we have a big increase in the percentage of uh, eBird checklists reporting white breasted nuthatches to the point that by November, um, there is like six or seven percent more eBird checklists are reporting white breasted nuthatches than would be uh, normally. And the big spike that we see in February is because there's a huge amount of data that's produced by the Great Backyard Bird Count. And you can see the Great Backyard Bird Count um, in years when there is a big migration of white breasted nuthatches in September the previous year, the following February, there's a big great backyard bird count of white breasted nuthatches. And um, then the, the next year there wouldn't be. And that those birds are gradually disappearing and it's returning to pretty much normal numbers of white breasted nuthatches um, by May and June. This doesn't happen in the Southern part of the eBird range. So down in the Carolinas and Florida, um, there's no increase in white breasted nuthatches those years. So this little animated map uh, takes a moment to understand, but the main thing that I want you to know is that it's the same thing that we were looking about at in the last figure, where um, the higher uh, percentage of checklists reporting white-breasted nuthatches is appearing in red. And so the, the left-hand corner of the graph says what month, and so now we're starting the, this thing again. And so in August and September, it's getting red, November, very red, December, January, very red, and then it starts to fade out. And by April, May, it's back to neutral. It's back to no, no difference. And so that's showing that across the huge red area, that's how big the white-breasted nuthatch eruption is. Um, and it's basically spreading across the whole, um, uh, you know, Great Lakes region, the Appalachians, the, um, the Piedmont, and, and the Mid-Atlantic coastal plain. Um, that whole region is where the white-breasted nuthatch eruption is. If we look at the figure on the left, um, the eruptions of the red-breasted nuthatches are a little bigger um, and, and involve the West a little bit more, but basically uh, at least the, the timing uh, is about the same. Another piece of data that we looked at was uh, band recoveries. So white-breasted nuthatches have been banded for a long time. Um, I was very shocked to find that there were more long-distance band recoveries uh, of white-breasted nuthatches in the database than there were of red-breasted nuthatch. Um, you see that there are more blue dots than there are red dots on this, um, on this map of long-distance band recoveries. And that's because white-breasted nuthatches are moving a lot. And the banding data shows that they move almost as much as uh, red-breasted nuthatches do. Most of these recoveries are not in the same migration season, but there was one um, recovery that showed long distance movement um, hundreds of miles in just a few weeks. Um, so the, it, does, it does confirm uh, migratory behavior in the fall uh, with, with the, the band recoveries. Um, one side note, not related to banding, but it is related to long distance movement is that um, on September 18th, 1931, uh, a dead white-breasted nuthatch was found on a beach in Bermuda. Um, and interestingly, uh, three days before that, uh, a big uh, storm hit New York City. And that storm involved a dramatic swing from a hot day to a very, very cold night. Um, and so what I think happened is that a bird was migrating and got blown by chilly west winds uh, and blown out to sea and uh, flew all the way uh, from somewhere in, in the Northeast uh, all the way to Bermuda. And seeing as uh, black pole warblers have the strength to do that, uh, black poles can go a lot farther than that. They can fly from Cape Cod to Venezuela. Um, we. Uh, I believe that uh, that's just another example of how far white-breasted nuthatches can fly. Obviously, it probably didn't want to go that far. It's just looking for land uh, and got too tired out. 
A big question uh, to make the argument that this is migration and not dispersal uh, is the age of the birds that are moving. And the only way that you can tell the difference between uh, a young white-breasted nuthatch and an adult white-breasted nuthatch is in the hand. Uh, so we had to look at banding data for this. And uh, the most valuable source for it was uh, the Long Point Bird Observatory data. Uh, and what we found was that the increases in the number of banded white-breasted nuthatches uh, was dramatic both for adults and immatures. In total, they banned more immatures than adults uh, on the peninsula. Um, and that may be because uh, inexperienced birds are more likely to wind up uh, in poor habitat uh, on the lakeshore instead of uh, you know, not making an error and getting stuck over the lake. Uh, but whether that's true or not, Either way, the data clearly confirms that it's both adults, like a dramatic increase in adults, as well as immatures in the eruption year, um, which takes away the theory that maybe it's just uh, juvenile dispersal that explains uh, the migrations that we've been seeing, uh, because you wouldn't have such a huge increase of adults uh, synchronously uh, if it was just uh, juvenile dispersal alone. Also, we did find one article that says that juvenile dispersal in white-breasted nuthatches, no matter in eruption years or not, just normally, uh, it happens in the summer anyway. Uh, so if that's the case, um, not much to worry about as far as uh, just, just normal, you know, post-nesting dispersal uh, behavior. But the real thing that um, uh, I think settled the issue that this was indeed migration uh, and not not just dispersal is the the clear signal that we found of a return flight of spring migration at Long Point. And the figure that you can see on the right, uh, it has the round blue dots uh, that are very high in the fall. And it has the, the little purple diamonds that are basically across the bottom of that figure um, in the fall. And uh, those represent the contrast between a big eruption year and a non-eruption year. And the red triangles in the middle are sort of intermediate. And if we look at counts the following spring, we see that there is a nice spring migration peak centered in late April in the years that there was a preceding fall migration. So that's birds that had to go back. We see them migrating north again in the spring. And we don't see any increase of white-breasted nuthatches in the springs when there had not been eruption uh, before. So hence the purple diamonds again being really low. The other thing uh, to keep in mind is that we do see white-breasted nuthatches flying north in um, uh, spring migration trap locations. Uh, so Derby Hill Hawk Watch uh, has what I think is the highest spring migration count for a single day of 54. That's a classic spring migration. Um, the fact that it happened on April 15th neatly agrees with uh, that being you know, the start of peak migration of white-breasted nuthatches that we saw at Long Point. And, um, your uh, your hawk watcher uh, at Presque Isle, Jerry McWilliams, uh, he told me that he has seen white-breasted nuthatches engaging in spring migration behavior there as well. So we kind of got answers to all six questions. Uh, it seems that uh, eruption is common. It's basically every other year. It's nothing particular about 1968. Um, that was you know a big one, but uh, it's it's a pretty regular thing. Um, it must involve huge numbers of birds uh, because if you increase the percentage of bird feeders that have white-breasted nuthatch um, in eastern northeastern U.S. by about 5%, well, there are hundreds of thousands of bird feeders in this region. So you increase by 5%, there has to be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of birds uh, that are, you know, moving uh, in the in the the normal eruption falls, not even the big eruptions. Um, is it widespread or is it very local? Uh, it's it's clearly widespread. Uh, we were seeing uh, evidence of the eruptions all across the Great Lakes, New England, Mid-Atlantic and Appalachian regions. Um, the reason that they move is just lack of food. It's the same thing as we see in red-breasted nuthatches, purple finches and pine siskins. Um, the birds appear to be moving a couple hundred miles is pretty regular uh, for them. And um, it's both adults and juveniles uh, that make the move. And uh, it looks like we have uh, a strong 
uh, spring uh, return migration. So it's it's uh, just like red-breasted nuthatches, basically, except uh, less noticeable because when they show up, uh, we hardly notice because we already had white-breasted nuthatches to begin with. Two more fun things. Uh, we, we were working on all this uh, across the summer of 20, um, sorry, that's a typo on the slide. It should say 2020. We were working on this across the summer of 2020 and we expected being an even numbered year that we would have a big um, eruption that fall. And so we, we told our birding friends and we wrote a little blog post uh, for some of the, the migration birder community, um, you know, talking about how we expected this would be a big uh, fall for white breasted nuthatches and be on the lookout for it. Um, and then right after that, uh, we had a, um, uh, the first ever uh, nocturnal flight call recording of a white breasted nuthatch uh, by Bill Evans in New York. And also the, the Cape May Bird Observatory's morning flight um, set their record for the most counted in a day. Uh, Daniel Irons had more than 70, uh, which was, I think, the, the record for um, New Jersey as a whole as well. So that was really cool that we predicted it and then it came true. A very, very satisfying uh, little piece of science um, for, for a, a birding nerd like me is a, a lot of joy in that. Um, so uh, as that project was wrapping up, uh, my enthusiasm moved towards who else has been migrating without me knowing it? Um, and what birds uh, should should we pay attention to? Um, I skimmed uh, eBird data sources for every species. Uh, I looked at uh, Long Point um, and Cape May data. And so I have here a few candidates that maybe don't have as strong of an eruption as white-breasted nuthatches, but these are some of the species that I think have underappreciated uh, movements. Um, for the red-bellied woodpeckers, uh, I want to share a little story um, <clears throat> that um, I was, when I was working on the white-breasted nuthatch project, I searched eBird for any mention of migratory behavior in the comments of a checklist um, in eBird. And one that I found was this checklist um, from a musician in um, New Jersey who does a hawk watch out of her own backyard. She calls it, I think, the purple chickadee hawk watch. And I found this absolutely glorious checklist. Um, in this checklist, um, I'll get back to the red-bellied woodpecker in a moment, but I found she said she had six white-breasted nuthatches. I know these birds do not migrate, but I distinctly saw three very high flying birds that were not my yard locals. Two were flying together very high up at first making circling patterns overhead, but eventually moving south. And one flew very high up straight out of the north heading south very quickly. The other three were local yard birds. Um, I sent her an email. I told her, hey, we're studying migration. I love your checklist. Um, we've been friends online since. Um, so that, that was really fun. But also in her checklist, she said, I have never seen red-bellied woodpeckers migrating, but I strongly believe that two of the birds I saw today were. I read that sometimes these birds move from the northern to the southern part of their breeding range, and I think that's what I was seeing. One bird was flying very high up from way up the mountain over my yard, all the way down as far as I could see. Not 90 seconds later, another bird did the same thing. Uh, the other twos were my were my local yard birds. So, you know, this, this stuff that you know, I was working on with big data sets and felt like, you know, such a special discovery. She was figuring this out just by looking up in her own backyard. And I, I just think that's so wonderful. Um, so again, uh, I, I meant to mention Andrew earlier, uh, but starting this whole project, uh, a big a big part of it uh, was the friendship that I've made with a, a counter at, at, um, at Hog Mountain. Andrew, uh, he 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 and I were you know emailing about this all the time. He's one of the people who told me that oh everybody at Cape May knows about this. Not everybody, but the migration counter folks they've known about this for years because they see it happening way more than we do in Pennsylvania. Um, so working with him on this whole project uh, was such a joy, and he has you know great photos like the the white breasted nuthatch uh, that was the cover slide, um, and these you know of, of birds in active migration uh, at Cape May. Um, so again, these are these are the Cape May counts, which Andrew and, and other counters have have contributed to. Um, and so this is just the same thing. The difference between the red line on top and the green line on the bottom, this uh, this huge gap 
shows the, the facultative eruptive uh, nature of migration. You know, this species that you might not think of as migratory um, at Cape May, they really see that it's migratory because they get a lot passing by uh, in those uh, even numbered falls and uh, not, not many um, those years. So presumably for the same reason, um, their, their season totals are in the hundreds uh, in the in the big migration years and just you know a dozen or two uh, a few dozen in the in the low migration years um, a big discovery about red-bellied woodpeckers just came out uh, is they started a new migration um, uh, site uh, the Maryland Bio biodiversity project started uh, a migration site in in 2021 at Turkey Point which is a peninsula that comes down into the top of the Chesapeake Bay uh, and it's a beautiful, um, uh, migration trap that's a little bit farther inland than Cape May is. And this narrow peninsula uh, just produces the most incredible uh, high counts of uh, uh, red-bellied woodpeckers and, and white-breasted nuthatches. Uh, they, they counted way more than Cape May ever did. Um, they're getting more in a single day than New Jersey gets uh, in a whole season. Um, and I, I believe that um, three of the three or four of these counts um, from this fall, this fall being the first even numbered year that they've done a count, um, four times they broke the world high count for for uh, red bellied woodpeckers in a season. So a, a really dramatic thing. Um, being such a small peninsula, sometimes they get um, you know birds circling, so it might not be you know actually that many different individual birds with with some repeats uh, coming back down the peninsula. Um, cause I think it's scary for those birds to cross the bay with so many falcons around and stuff, but, uh, either way, like, even if those numbers aren't exact, like they just have like the last tree at the bottom of the peninsula, just covered in red bellied woodpeckers, like really spectacular scene. Um, so really, really awesome, um, recognition, you know, from having a site like that to see really how migratory these woodpeckers are. Um, so yeah, as you see that this is just one season, um, a total of 3,735. Uh, this is just really mind-blowingly a huge count of red-bellied woodpeckers in migration there. Literally yesterday um, on my Facebook birding news, um, one of the uh, Maryland banding stations uh, reports that they had uh, a red-bellied woodpecker um, that they uh, had banded on October 25th showed up. Fuck! Oh my god! Um, showed up just just a little while later um, at uh, um, November 3rd um, in Virginia, uh, 150 miles southwest. So you know just. What is that? Uh, 25th to 31st, six, uh, nine days later, um, it's showing up 150 miles away. So, you know, this is not just birds moving around on the, in the corner of Maryland. Uh, it's clearly birds that are actively migrating. Another one that I'm super excited about uh, is tufted titmouse, uh, tufted titmice. Uh, are a species that I really thought is, you know, a classic resident bird, not a migrant, not at all. And um, we, we are seeing a similar pattern, not a huge number of birds, but a similar pattern at Cape Spots May. Spots a bird the other day. And at Turkey Point, um, that they have this, this big uh, increase uh, in the even numbered years uh, and very few moving uh, in the odd numbered years. Um, it's already known for, you know, a sister species like uh, black capped chickadee uh, that there's some migration, but there's very little literature on tufted titmice uh, having a regular migration. And uh, one place that this is really evident is New York City. Um, in the city in recent years, uh, tufted titmice are not nesting uh, in the city very much. And so because there's tons of e-birders, uh, they really notice the contrast between some winters when they have a huge number of tufted titmice. Um, you can see a couple of these lines here in the fall are showing a large percentage of, of titmouse checklists uh, in New York um, in uh, 2020 
and uh, this purple line, it only stops because that's when I downloaded the data. Uh, but this year they have a lot of tit mice in the city and 2018, they had a lot in the city. Whereas these two lines down here, which were 2019 that fall and uh, 2021 when they had almost none. So again, uh, fitting that pattern beautifully. Um, and I just loved uh, in Ryan Mandelbaum's um, uh, blog, uh, one of his birding friends, uh, Shai Mitra, he says, um, getting a white-breasted nuthatch in, in migratory flight is one of the best, but tufted titmouse is the holy grail. And so Ryan talked about this when he saw titmice this fall um, trying to fly across uh, the, the bay from Breezy Point, you know, out past um, uh, the, the end of um, Long Island all the way uh, to New Jersey. They're just heading, heading across, which is a, a crazy open air flight for, for a titmouse. Um, and I also got to see uh, titmice uh, in morning flight um, as well uh, when I went and visited Turkey Point. But I wanna uh, show this, this fellow was at a, a Yankee game tailgate in New York City. Um, and he's just hanging out at the tailgate and he recorded 44 tufted titmouse all trickling southbound uh, past uh, this um, this site beside uh, the Yankees game. Um, you know, just like who would have ever thought that you'd be out there and see a huge number of tufted titmice uh, in migration? And most of us would never see this. Like, you know, if I was birding in Pennsylvania and titmice were moving through the trees, I just think, oh, those are the local titmice moving through. Oh, you know, maybe there's a little bit more today. Um, but uh, they, they, they were seeing them at the coast, like acting clearly migratory, which, which is awesome. So getting to the almost the end of the presentation, um, Northern Cardinals, uh, while we were working on, you know, white-breasted nuthatch, seeing this paper come out about Northern Cardinals erupting northwards into Ontario and showing a little bit of a pattern of higher numbers appearing at the northern edge of the range than in the um, than in the odd numbered falls. Uh, that that was kind of encouraging that maybe they're they're connected to the same underlying system. So I checked it at Cape May, and what do you know? At Cape May, we see more. Northern Cardinals counted as migrants in those eruption years than in the non-eruption years. They never uh, counted any um, as, as potential migrants. So it seems, although it's not a large volume, that there are some. And I just want to point out um, a, a, really, uh, a really crazy checklist here um, for, the, for the Cardinals. Um, let me show you this amazing... Um, there are these guys who do, um, they call it nightclub. They look at um, migrating uh, birds at night by spotlighting them uh, down at Cape May. And they had, on a big night of migration with tons of other birds, they had an, a Northern Cardinal uh, migrating by. So that's, that's really awesome uh, to me. Um, and uh, another species uh, that I wanna mention is Carolina Wren. Um, the main thing that got me interested in this, uh, it's not an you know, even odd numbered year thing. Uh, it's just a, a different phenomenon. This, this one Carolina wren that was found so far from where most of the rest of the population is in Canada, it made me think, I wonder if they will ever make it across the bay uh, and, and populate Newfoundland as they expand their range north. And I got to thinking, you know, if they just move tree to tree, bush to bush, they would never get to Newfoundland. And so I started looking at other islands and I looked at Nantucket and I found that they had them at Nantucket and I looked at the breeding bird atlas and in the previous breeding bird atlas, um, 1974 to 1979, there were no Carolina runs on Nantucket, but recently they are there. And so the question is, how did Carolina runs get to Nantucket if they don't fly, uh, you know, big open air flights like could they do that during the day why would they ever want to like what what it would attract a carolina wren to fly over the beach out over the ocean to you know a distant island is that something that they would do or are they nocturnally migrating around like house wrens and marsh wrens and um winter wrens the other migratory wrens and do they do they also take some big nocturnal flights and you know occasionally wind up uh, offshore and and start a family out there i would wager that they're doing big nocturnal flights and you know they don't do it as much as house wrens 
but I think they probably do it a little bit, and that explains why they got to Nantucket, just a hypothesis. Um, so there are lots of other species. Uh, they got a downy woodpecker in, in nocturnal flight, um, uh, Tom Johnson's photo. So um, that's cool. Uh, a pileated woodpecker, I was at Turkey Point, and we saw one fly out off the end of the point, um, heading south. Uh, it got scared out of the open water and, and turned back, apparently. Um, but it was just crazy to see a pileated acting like it was a migrant. And just a few days before that, they had counted one possible pileated woodpecker acting like a migrant uh, at Cape May uh, that year. So just the idea that some species, even though they're mostly resident, occasionally do this, I just find that uh, to be fascinating. I just think about you know what it would be like uh, to, to be a species that doesn't normally do this and just go on a big trip somewhere. <laughs> Um, so to conclude, uh, even for the most resident species, some wander, and the wandering sometimes has a logic and an underlying pattern. And birding will continuously surprise us with new things, uh, even for the most common birds. So, you know, I think even if we're not uh, going after big rarities or traveling long distances, um, birding is going to be fascinating and, and have a lot, uh, a lot to enrich our lives in a, in a lot of different ways. So thanks for your attention. It was a long talk, um, but uh, I'm happy to start taking some of the questions. Wow, that was very interesting. I never would have thought of that, the, all of these common birds migrating. All right, let's see. Where is my chat? Uh, I'm going to start at the beginning. Is there something significant about the fact that you used odd versus even in years, or that was just arbitrary, but that was the year that you gathered the data, true? Odd versus even. So the, yeah, the reason that I chose odd numbered years is, uh, um, and aggregated them and even numbers years and aggregated them is just because in recent years, it just so happens that the the even numbered years are when we have the the migrations and the odd numbered years are the ones where they stay home because there's plenty of food in the forest um so it's nothing in particular about um odd or even because it does switch over history sometimes there's a couple bad years or a couple good years in a row of, of mass production and the pattern uh will switch but um yeah it's uh it's just because of the food production okay Let's see, um, questions about white-breasted nuthouse at the northern edge of their breeding range. Is there a concurrent noticeable reduction in their numbers, for example, of 50 to 100% of the white-breasted nuthatches are leaving in eruption area years, or is the reduction more subtle, such as only a 10% reduction of white-breasted nuthatches, nuthatches departing? Yeah, wonderful question. It's one that I worked on and never got quite the satisfying data set that I wanted for it. So at feeders, they increase. But what I want to know is at the northern edge of their range in the deep forest, what is happening? And unfortunately, it's hard to separate eBird data. Most people who do um, eBird bird around towns, like parks, and around water, which are good refuges for feeding in the winter. And what I think is the source population for these eruptions are non, with no water, no feeders, deep forest. I think those are the areas that produce a lot of white-breasted nuthatches, and they leave and head out. And if there was an easy way to separate the eBird data to just show Ontario, New York, even Pennsylvania, the, the deep woods habitat, only the checklists that were not close to any houses or, or any lakes or anything, I think that's where we would see the reduction, but it remains unproven, so. Okay. And somebody noted that this is the first year that she's had four white-breasted nuthatches on my feeder. Huh. It's an up year. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, let's um, see. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
uh, someone wanted said that blue jays migrate any further data on them um because i know we see we think of blue jays as winter birds um but i know they do migrate hmm. yeah um so blue jays because they're very t closely tied to oak and oak doesn't follow the regular pattern as the other plants um they're sort of marched to the beat of a slightly different drum um so I didn't pay as much attention to them um, because oaks are just complicated and like the regional synchronization isn't quite the same. Um, and there's lots of species of oaks. So I can't speak to blue jays very good, but their migration is awesome. And you know, you guys at along the lakes, you you can sometimes count a thousand in a day and stuff. So that's that's really awesome. Absolutely. Um Lisa Genko said, should we have a different term for migration since so-called true migrants back and forth every year? Um, you know, I am not quite, um, should we have a different term for migration? Since so in, in the ornithologists, like the, the more technical lingo, it's more like, um, Obligate migrant means you have to migrate every year, like black pole warbler, broad winged hawk. And facultative migrant means you could do it or not, depending on the situation for you. Um, and so that's the finches and the nut hatches and um, at least white breasted and red breasted and you know some of some of what we're seeing. Um, so yeah, I I think it's a migration, and migration is the right word as long as they're coming back to breed again you know is if if they if they just leave and never come back then we'll just call that dispersal but if if they're going to leave and then come back then that's migration and if they do it every year it's obligate and if they only do it when they have to then it's facultative yeah. okay. carolyn had a suggestion of plant foods every other year Mom always said that was true of our vintage apple trees, and she's going to start recording this as well as the cones on the Norway spruce in her yard. I oh. I want to I I want to get data on pine nut production in places that produce pine nuts commercially, and I want to get data on their yields, and I want to I want to see data going back in time and see if that correlates with um you know birds in those regions um i i don't know how to get industry data on um on pine nut production but i also want to look for like walnut production and other other mast crops that are economically viable and presumably tracked by the by their industries um but yes uh you know the whole notion of attracting birds based on food that's semi-natural or produced by the plants is you know what i'm all about you know i was i was so thrilled to see the evening gross beak um just eating like maple seeds on the tree you know it wasn't hitting a feeder it was it was eating you know a, a plant produced food up on the tree and i i just love that uh, let's see has there been use of radio tracking technology in addition to bands to track these non-migratory migrants. And thank you for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, so generally, not much. Um, there's a little bit going on with evening gross beaks um, and some of those that are sort of famous facultative migrants. But um, it would be, you know, in the old days when, when trackers were really expensive and really cost prohibitive to, to manage, um, it would be a silly idea because you could put it on there and then the birds just stay there and never move and that would be boring. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, yeah, they, uh, um, unless, unless you already knew that they were in a population that tended to move, it would be, it would be not the best idea, but now with the modus network, where they have the tags that are very light and relatively cheap and 
in some parts of Canada, they have a great network of modus towers that are everywhere that you can keep track of individual birds quite well as they move across the landscape. Um, I would so be thrilled if someone would put some trackers on, you know, some white breasted nuthatches, some titmice, some red bellied woodpeckers and, and see it happening in real time. That would be that would be a big deal for for me. I would I would be uh, absolutely all about that. Um, but I'm not going to be able to make that happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Lundberg suggested that perhaps there's a pine nut futures commodity market. And maybe you, <laughs> <laughs> that would tell a story about pine nut production. Help, help me with that, Chris. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. um, and someone, this is a great question, actually. Do these um, faculative migrants go to the same place every time like obligate migrants? So with like red cross bills and stuff, definitely not like they'll they'll do different things different times, depending on the conditions on the trees. Um, but for red breasted nut hatches um, or or, um, you know, black cap chickadees that are sort of better known facultative uh, migrants, um, I, I don't really know, but I would suspect uh, possibly to some extent. Um, so yeah, I I can't I can't say for sure, but I'm gonna have a hunch that probably some of them, you know, they remember where they went and they go they go back. Um, I I would expect that um, if I had to put my money on some future tracking study, that sometimes we'd see some winter site fidelity like we see with obligate migrants sometimes. Um. Ruth, Ruth is asking a question about red-headed nut, red-headed woodpeckers, um, and she said, "What do you call red-headed woodpeckers?" And I think that maybe there's a typo there. Um, uh, it's, she says they were common many years on Presque Isle until there was a bad crop of acorns. They have never returned to the same density as there they were before. And I. Mm, so I, I, in my project, I've focused mostly on birds that weren't super well recognized as migrants and red, red headed woodpeckers are like flickers and sap suckers. Everybody knows that they're white, they're migratory woodpeckers. Um, certainly, you know, in my part of Pennsylvania, we have way more in the summer than we do in the winter. Sometimes one hangs on um, uh, into the winter and we get a couple on the Christmas counts, uh, you know, at the at the really good breeding sites, but mostly they leave. Um, so I just haven't paid as much attention to them, but I would imagine that them sticking around some winters when they occasionally do might be driven by some of the same, you know, good wild food conditions that we see for, you know, when red bellies don't migrate or when, um, uh, you know, tip mice or, or black cap chickadees or whatever, don't move either. Here's a question. What is spotlighting and does it bother migrating birds? Yeah, so if, um, <clears throat> if you're in an environment where it's totally pitch dark and you shine a light in an animal's eyes, it can disorient and blind them just like you know if you were if you were walking and you were hiking and it was dead pitch dark and then you had bright lights in your eyes like that's just blinding but if there's a decent amount of ambient light in the surrounding area like if you're close to the city of cape may you know where there's lights in the city a a, a brighter light on you is presumably not much worse than just like when you're driving a car and it's kind of annoying that there's a bright lights car coming at you, but it's not like, not like you can't keep driving um, and your eyes readjust in, in a matter of a few seconds and you know, you're, you're pretty normal. Um, so it's thought, it's thought to be bad practice to spotlight on animals, the darker it is, like if it's dead dark, that's, that's like bad. But if it's, if it's not that dark, the impact on your eyes is not as bad as it as it is if it's um, uh, if as if it's pitch black. So there there are ethics standards for photography about use of flash, and that's the main thing that that I understand about that. Yeah. 
um, is the geographic extent of migration of these species, how far they go, known um, at this time. And, and she also added a side note that the four resident cardinals in her southwestern Pennsylvania yard were not happy about the four new birds a few weeks ago. <laughs> I, I love your observation at the end there. I I was literally thinking about that two days ago while I was birding and I was watching white-breasted nuthatches having some big fights. And I saw on Facebook, another friend talking about white-breasted nuthatches having some big fights and a red-breasted, a red-bellied woodpeckers having a fight. And I'm like, I wonder if the local residents are fighting arrivals mm -hmm. from the North and that they're having territorial conflicts and wouldn't it be nice if in the future we had people mentioning in their eBird comments mentions of the aggression and that we could track frequency of mentions of interspecies aggression hmm. in even numbered falls versus odd numbered falls <laughs> right and see see the impact on their lives. The open-ended comment fields in eBird, I think is gonna be a, a future for mining more interesting behavioral information than just movement. Um, as for geographic extent, it seems the vast majority of the white-breasted nuthatches that are moving um, through Canada are um, just, um, are just settling as far south as like Virginia, maybe Western North Carolina, that kind of um, range. And that um, farther south than that, we don't see much of the, the signal between the even numbered years and the odd numbered years. So I, I would say the geographic extent of these eruptions would be the Great Lakes region, the Appalachians, uh, the Piedmont, um, and some of um, the Midwest that are at similar latitudes. Um, Carolyn added, Project Feeder Watch invites notes on displacement and or depredation among birds. There's also a place for notes. Good for point. Watch. Yeah, so, great point. Another good use. And, and there was a cool study about, about the, uh, the pecking order at the feeders, right? Um, the aggression between different species. Um, so yeah, excellent. Great thought. Thanks for mentioning that. Anybody else? I have a question. Um, we have a couple of like old records, uh, CDs, and now you can have it on your iPod or iPhone bird recordings to look up. But you know they're usually um, at at the feeders or in flocks or whatever. Is there any uh, collection of recording of nocturnal bird calls? Because I'd be interested in listening to something like that. Yeah. Um... Give me give me thirty seconds and I'll drop uh, I'll drop some links in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, a field guide to um, the uh, nocturnal uh, flight calls of uh, eastern North American land birds put together by uh, Bill Evans uh, and Michael O'Brien, um, and that's that's the first link, and then. Um, this is not only nocturnal flight calls, but is um, all uh, all species of birds, including uh, it will mention if it's a flight call, um, uh, is the Peterson's Field Guide uh, to Bird Sounds, which there's an Eastern and a Western uh, done by uh, Nathan Peplow. Um, and it has an online resource that is my second link. Um, and, uh, if you're if you're really interested in uh, nocturnal flight call stuff, um, I made a uh, bibliography of um, sources and and relevant things uh, with the help of uh, Julia Plummer, uh, who's a birder here in um, central Pennsylvania, who has um, helped me uh, collect these resources, and so uh, I will put that down as the um, as the third link here in a second, and it it has it has these two links and and many more uh, here. 
Great, we've got him. Thank you very, very much. Will will the will the chat be part of the YouTube video? No. Hmm. no. Generally, it's not. Um, Anybody uh, wants to find that stuff? Um, if you just Google search for um, what I was basically talking about, that will get you to the Evans and O'Brien uh, nocturnal flight calls of land birds guide, and uh, if you just search for Bird Academy Eastern Birds, you'll get to the second link. And uh, if you want the final link, if you Google my name, you can find my email address on the Penn State website and you can uh, ask me and I'll send you the bibliography. Okay, there is a, a comment that I can save, the, you can save the chat. I you know I can save the chat. It actually automatically comes to me as the host. Oh, okay, you're talking about the participants then. All right, click on the dots to save the chat. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it hit select all and then you can hit copy. God, okay, very good. Thank you, Freda. Any other comments, questions? Um, this this was kind of an open ended one because I'm you know it the birds obviously instinctively go south when they erupt because that they know that north is probably worse. It, I, I'm like, what tells I mean, if they're if they're a non obligate migrant, what tells them to go south? Well. Um... If we're talking about a lot of the finches, they do quite a lot of east-west migration. Okay. Um, so they go across Canada. Many times when the when the seed crops fail uh, in uh, the boreal forests of eastern Canada, there are good producing crops uh, in the Rockies and um, western Canada. And so a lot of pine siskin band recoveries are really long distance east west and same thing with crossbills um, and uh, one of the things that kind of typifies uh, the the facultative migration is it's it's less northwest organized um, and a little bit more open to chasing the food wherever it goes um, there are some records of white-breasted nut hatches north of their normal range in uh, eruption years. Um, so sometimes they do make the mistake of going the wrong way, um, but that happens to obligate migrants too, um, that in migration season, sometimes they go the wrong way. Um, mm -hmm. I think the majority of them are going the right way. And I think um, that their ancestors who went the wrong way died. And so if there are any genetic systems that predispose them to going the right way, they're gonna be inherited. Um, and so uh, I think the same underlying systems that predispose, um, you know, migratory insects and migratory birds and migratory mammals to go the right way, um, even when they don't have an adult to teach them, uh, I think they're going to be there too. Where can we view the data on yearly mass production so the um marty obard and um derek potter um they publish reports about their um uh their mass production in ontario and i have those um i have some stuff that they emailed me as spreadsheets that i used for the research but other stuff um that i'm finding I just popped in a Google search for Derek Potter mass production in, in Ontario. Um, and I, I see some of the same, um, the same data. Um, so uh, if you want to see what I'm talking about, um, I just did a, a Google search uh, for um, uh, Derek Potter mass production in Ontario. And you can see these are the same graphs that I was that I was showing you. Mm -hmm. um, so these these links get it for you. I assume that that's going to be a, a good enough resource for the person who asked the question. I know yeah. I certainly. You can 
if you if you want to have put me if you want me to put you in touch with with Derek, just email me. You can find my email off of Penn State's website. It's also j99 at psu.edu. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you, everybody.